Welcome to the Menopause Lifestyle Solution Podcast hosted by Olivia Francis. Now, each month I invite a discussion on a chosen topic within menopause, the highs, the lows, the experiences of midlife as women go through our modern day society. Now today, I have the pleasure of introducing Carolyn Harris, Labour MP for Swansea East, who is making waves by highlighting the importance of menopause on our workforce and has been active in breaking the taboo associated with menopause. Um, with 12 million women currently in the menopause here in the UK, isn't it about time that it's highlighted more at work? and more understood within our population. So Carolyn, a huge welcome and thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. Could you tell us a little bit about your background because you do so many things um, and it was, very, it was very difficult to sum it up and I know that you'll be better than me at doing that. So could oh you- just... Well, I wasn't, I wasn't born to be a politician. I'm from a very working class family. I didn't go to university till I was 34. And when I went to university, I was actually a dinner lady. And the only reason I went to university is in 1989, I'd lost my eldest son in a road accident. He was eight at the time. And uh, no, I spent two years in a really dark, dark place. Mm -hmm. um, and when I emerged from that dark place, I had to decide whether um, I wanted just to continue to do the prodding along through life as I was doing, or whether I wanted to do a little bit more. And, and I, I wanted to achieve something, and I didn't quite know what I wanted to achieve, but I knew that having lost Martin, I needed to go up rather than down, because it would be quite easy to go down, as many people have when they've lost children. So I ended up going to university. Hang on, Liv, I'm going to put the cat out for a minute, because he's... He's clambering over plastic bags. <laughs> I wondered what that sound was. I've shut the door now. Okay. Sorry about that. Yes. So I went to university and I I still worked in in a, in a school well uh, as a dinner lady when I was in university. But I used to work I help out in the classrooms, and then I just I worked in. Um, different voluntary organisations. Eventually, anyway, long story short, I became an MP in 2015. And I, I became an MP at a time when, in my time of my life, where I had, the only thing I had to contribute is my knowledge of what was like in real life. So I've, I've not come in there with this preconceived idea of, you know, um, MPs, are all knowing, all seeing, and, and you know, the, we, we just wake up in the morning and think, I'm an MP today, and we can spout all this wonderful stuff, because that's not the truth. The only way you actually help the people you serve is by knowing the people you serve. And I know what it's like to struggle. I know what it's like to not have much money. I know what it's like to be so deeply involved in your own grief that you can't even wash your own face. Um, and I know how vulnerable people are for different reasons. You know, there's so many people out there who have vulnerabilities that we just look past and we ignore or we criticise them for. We see women on the streets maybe victims of prostitution or homeless or with a, an alcohol or a drug problem. And we don't stop and think, why is that woman in that position or why is that man in that position? We always assume there's some deviance behind it. And that's not always the case. Um, and there's a lot of issues and addictions, a bit like, like gambling addiction, which are hidden and nobody really knows why that person has, adapt, has been absorbed by that addiction or by that terrible situation. But there will always be a reason why. And I just felt that I have a platform where I can... <sighs> I suppose I can use, I use my platform to get stuff and information and things from people who have it, to share it with people who haven't got it. And the way that's transpired has been through, um, I do it a lot with feeding kids in the summer. We, you know, we've got a very minimum one this summer because of COVID, but um, we've, we've fed at probably about 30,000, if not more kids over the last four years during the summer recess. During COVID, we have fed people. We've done over 35,000 meals since March. Um, I, I do a lot of work with a, um, a charity called Beauty Banks. And Beauty Banks, Sally Hughes and George Jones, they recognise that if somebody's going to a food bank, 
then they're obviously not going to be buying sanitary towels, deodorant, soap, the basics for human dignity. So I work a lot with, with beauty banks and I provide, or I facilitate the provision of toiletries to vulnerable people, whether they are going through a food bank or whether they're street homeless or whether they are, you know, they're actually at this moment in time, the kids are in one of the um, summer play schemes I'm involved in, but th these are in communities where there's a lot of deprivation. So to give somebody who's on a really low income a nice shampoo and a nice conditioner is phenomenally exciting and important for them because they probably would never be able to afford that. And I just think that if I can use my platform to give them a little bit of pleasure and a little bit of luxury sometimes, then my job is, has been done. And that's what I've always done. I, I look at injustice and I think, I don't think let's talk about it. I think, what can we do to change it? So I am very much a doer rather than a talker. I do talk, and when I do get going in the House of Commons, and I do have a rant, and I do, I do rant, but I have had success with my rants. And we've had the introduction of the Children's Funeral Fund because of my ranting, and we've had a huge reduction in stake on fixed or spetting terminals because of it. We're working towards changing the Gambling Act. I've done quite a bit of work on menopause. I think I was one of the people who've been instrumental in getting it spoke about in the House of Commons. But traditionally, if you didn't want to talk, if you didn't want the men involved in a conversation, you would talk about periods of menopause. That's not as effective now because men are, are far more receptive to urine on both subjects because it affects everybody. It doesn't just affect the women. And um, so that's me really. You know, I'm, I am a doer. Um, but I will talk when I need to. So you're a doer, you're a mover, and you're a shaker for sure. Um, and really, tell us about breaking that menopause taboo. How, how are you going about that? I know that you said you're a talker and you do things, you make things happen. So what does the future look like for breaking that taboo? Because of my job, I talk to many people in different walks of life. And when you listen to people talking about the, the issues that affect their world, there will always be similarities with what affects somebody else's world. And it's usually common denominators. And menopause is one of those common denominators. So I could be talking to a woman who's you know, really high flyer within a massive business, and we could talk about the retention of female employees. And one of the issues will be that women come to that time in life, young, not just old, but younger women as well, where the menopause becomes a problem. And you know, we talk about how do we retain those women in the workforce, or we could be talking about somebody who has, uh, because of the menopause and the change in, in, the, in the, the brain patterns or whatever it is, endorphins or whatever that changes the way we think, how they become addicted or self-medicate, which a lot of women self-medicate. Um, and I just make the links. And I'd, I'd like to be in a position where we are prepared rather than, we can't change the past. We can't go back in history and say, let's swipe this all out and make it different. But I would really like us as a country to be one of the first countries in the world which has really thought about preparing for future generations of women. Um, so probably too late for me, but for other, other women coming behind me, like my daughter-in-law and, and you know the girls who work in my office, then, I'd like to think that when they reach that time, there will be more thought gone into how they live and survive and, well, exist through the menopause and that there's something there from at the end of it. It's not just scrappy time, which it was. If we think back to my mother's time, it was scrappy time. You know, I can remember when my mother went through the menopause and, you know, she was working, she worked in Marks and Spencer's, but she, she was really worried that because she didn't feel very well that not going to work was an issue. It's less of an issue now because you can't actually talk to managers about it, but not all managers. You can in places like Tesco who have understood this. And if you're in a union, then you've got that protection. But a lot of firms haven't got that structure. So there's a lot of companies out there who don't, really don't understand the benefits of retaining women whilst they go through this period because at the end of it, they can be even more productive than they were before. Yeah, very true. And, you know, with one in 10 women actually leaving their jobs due to the menopause and one in four actually thinking about it, you know, we, we do have a almost a task on our hand to get that message across. And 
with the, with the fastest growing demographic, aren't we, of the workforce at the moment, um, do you think that companies value the skills and experience of older women? They're getting better. Um, I think the glass ceiling is cracking slightly, but that's hard work has got us to that point. It, it wasn't a given. It was, we've always had to work harder to prove ourselves more than men. Well, I'm, and I'm not a rampant feminist, but I, I honestly always think that the assumption is, has always been that the men would, su would succeed in business and in work and women would be the, the supplementary to that. So they would have the jobs which supported the big job. But there are more women in the big jobs now, thankfully. Um, but you, you, I still find that now. I mean, certainly culturally, that I may do an event or a surgery with, with, um, with certain people and certain organisations. And they're quite taken back that I'm a woman and I'm an MP. And, you know, it's, oh, you know, why would you think I wouldn't be a woman? I've gone, we, well, my husband and I booked into a hotel and they had, when you put the TV on, they had, and it, it welcomes you, welcomes, whatever. It was, it was a work thing. It was good for years ago now. And they had Mr. David Harris, MP, and Mrs. Harris. Uh, and, and they had him as the MP, which he, he still, still laughs about now. But we'll often do something. My husband will come with me, and they'll talk to David. I mean, I, I have loved my husband dearly, but, you know, he, you know he's, he's not the MP I am. And to, you can talk to him all day, but he's not going to be able to affect change. I can. Mm -hmm. So... You know, it's just sometimes it takes longer and I think that women have always had to work harder and women during the menopause haven't got this, the energy sometimes to fight. So I don't want us to have to have that fight. Mm. I want it to be a given that, you know, you, you can do the things you need to do to make your working experience bearable during this time without having to explain every time to somebody that... I've got, I'm not feeling very well, I'm, my memory's slightly gone. You shouldn't have to do all that. It should, be, it should be embedded in work practice that you just do whatever is necessary. So within going to the more exciting thing, I suppose, of possible legislation, would it entail that aspect, so a woman's right to discuss her health and well-being? Do you foresee that? that coming into the workplace? I think we need to get to that place. I think we are, we are, we're a country, you know, we're one of, the, one of the leading countries in the world. We shouldn't be having these conversations now. We should have already have done this. It should be done. It's not difficult to do. But, but I think the problem is, it's not just one area. Is it? We need to look at all the areas involved with a woman through this period and actually make sure that we've covered all the bases, if you like. So there will be, um, there will be aspects of the menopause which will affect your health and well-being. There'll be aspects of the menopause which affect the economy. There's aspects of the, you know, which are, so with, there's so many different areas that we have to, don't talk in silos, let's talk all together. And that's where I'd like to be, where we'd actually all sit around the table, all brainstorming what we, what we think it should look like and what we can offer to get us to that point and come up with a strategy which we can then get adopted by the government, whether it's in its entirety or whether it slots into the different government departments it's relevant to. I, I don't know yet. I mean, these are, these are broad conversations. And I'd like, I, I don't want to leave Parliament until I've achieved something which actually talks about the whole area at the the menopause effects and what we as a modern society have done to make sure that we've thought about it and we've put in a safety net to make sure that we protect those involved. Just going on from that really about supporting what you do so if somebody was listening to what you were saying here today and they wanted to get involved get in touch interact and support what would be the first steps? Because quite often that's that's the initial start of getting yeah. that ball rolling isn't it? Yeah I mean there are there are a lot of different organisations which are looking at the menopause, but each one of them has got a particular slant, if you like. So, you know, you, you, there, there's really good campaigns out there. So I suppose initially you need to look, look for something on social media which actually is relevant to what you're thinking of. In your case, Livy, it would be someone who's interested in you know, health eating and exercise and, and that side of it. Well, then you'd be the perfect person to speak to. If you were somebody who was having an issue within the workplace, then 
my first advice to you would be to join a union. And when you've joined that union, ask that, that union what work they are doing on the menopause and follow that pattern. There would be other situations where um, it could be the lack of medical advice that there is and how a lot of women are being driven to go private for HRT because their GP knows very little about it. And instead of, instead of being a gatekeeper to access in, they're a gatekeeper to stop you having it. So a lot of women are going into a lot of debt in order to access the HRT. So there's loads of different campaigns which are looking at the different aspects. But what worries me is those silos don't always meet up. And that's what I want to do is to bring all those little organisations together so we have one set of, one structure which will look at everything and encourage everybody to sing from the same hymn sheet. And therefore give more education to, to more people. Correct. Yeah. Right. I think I, th I think it should. Well, talking about education, I think there's nothing wrong with putting um, the menopause on the national curriculum, for example. You know, we we barely talk about periods. You know, we we're only now talking about sex and relationships in school. You know, we we are really bad at teaching our youngsters of what to expect expect when you you hit those obstacles in life. So I mean, I I see nothing wrong with even you know just touching on the fact that women's bodies, well, men's bodies change, all our bodies change, and that what you can expect. We should be educating our children better that what they can anticipate further down the road. You know, it's not a laughing matter. You know, I, th I think we've moved, we, we should have moved on from the, oh, she's got, I mean, go back, Liv, and, and look at the time when women were taken to their bed when they had a period. Mm -hmm. You know, they had the vapours. You know, they were... It, but if you look, if I look back at history, especially when you look at, you know, you re, I'm a big reader of history. When you look back and you see the things that weren't mentioned, but when you read them, you know exactly what they're talking about. No, we didn't say the word period. We said monthlies. No, why are we always so embarrassed to actually say what it is? Mm. We've got to stop this. We've got. No, I know that we're a reserved nation, but we really do need to get more out there and and say what we mean. Otherwise, we we can talk on the subject forever. We're not going to get anywhere. I think that's what I do. I mean, I'm not afraid to use the word period, menopause. You know, somebody's vagina. We've got them. Use the words. You know, let's not be afraid to say. You know, I I have actually used the word vaginal dryness in front of of a man. No, but. It's true. It's, it's a symptom of the menopause. Get used to it. Yeah, exactly. And this is all about breaking that taboo. Yeah. So it can be general conversation, whether it's amongst women or whether it's amongst men, but it needs to be accepted, correct? Don't apologise for it. Don't, don't apologise for using and talking about issues which we, have, we experience daily. You're not swearing at someone. You're not, you know, you're not saying something which is untrue. You're saying the truth. It's a symptom of and a consequence of the menopause. Just say it. I think it's the working class in me, you know, I haven't got time to, to frill things up. I've got to say it, get it out. So, I mean, in summary, um, is there any particular message you would like to convey in this podcast when it goes out there into the... Yeah, I, I think, don't be afraid to talk about it and share, um, share how you were feeling and also support, support other women who are feeling maybe the same, maybe different. We'll all have different symptoms. There will be links between them all. But So get involved, talk about it, support each other, and get involved to make sure that your voice is not silent. And like I said, get involved in an area which interests you most until we're at that point where we're all talking about the same thing and from the same hymn sheets. But you know, don't be afraid to ask questions and to ask for something which basic is basic human rights. If you were in a, if you're working in a, a place where the uniform is really restrictive and by just having different material or by wearing something slightly less restrictive, you could perform your tasks better, ask for it. If you travel to work, I mean, it's, it's, this probably is only in really busy cities like London, but if, Travelling on the tube early morning is really difficult for you because you feel claustrophobic or, you, you know, you're oppressed by that. Ask, can you go in later? Same when you finish your work. Ask, can you go home earlier or later? Ask for more flexible. If you work on the tellers, ask, can you work on the chiller? If you work in a supermarket, you know, ask. You shouldn't have to ask for a fan. I firmly believe that if you work in an environment where you can use an electric fan to help you feel better, they should be just there. You take one. You aren't going to explain why you need it. You know, 
I, I really think that we, we've got to get better at second guessing what we need and making it available for women to actually just go to. I mean, one of the consequences as we get older is, is bladder control. You know, mm. it's a huge issue. Um, we've had children or we've not had children, but we've lost that. You know, that muscle is not as good as it was and we have to go to the toilet more often. Or oh, God forbid, you've got to wear a pad, but you've got to wear them. Don't be ashamed to say, well, my bladder's so bad, I'm wearing a pad now. I'm not ashamed to say it. You know, anybody goes, and I've seen people at checkouts in, in um, supermarkets embarrassed because they've got a packet of, they, they call them incontinence pads. But we're not incontinent. This just a thing that happens, you know. We, why do we have to give these things a name that makes it sound as if we like, you know, we've reached, we, we're now dotage and we know we're likely to wet ourselves at any minute. What, call it something else. It's these are aids to help us have a more productive, nicer life. You know, don't be embarrassed by it. Mm. You've got to go to the toilet ten times. You've got to go to the toilet ten times. You can't help it. Now, I I'm constantly on the toilet. You know, I'm weeing all the time. Whenever I go, two cups of coffee, and then I can be weeing for the next hour. Wherever we go, I look for the toilet, and it's a bit of a joke, but that's fine. But it's the truth. I know it's good. So I think it's all these things about, well, they're only human things. Don't be ashamed of who you are or what you are. Talk about them freely, because the more we talk about them, the less of a taboo there will be around them. And we will then, we'll all be talking about something that really matters and we can affect change then. Fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, speaking from your heart and being honest about where you are with your health and your life, I guess, and breaking those current taboos. So thank you for joining us today, everyone. And do remember to get in touch. And together, let's really break the taboo around the menopause. And this is Livia Francis, founder of the Menopause Lifestyle Solution.com. Thank you for joining us on our quest to bring the menopause to the forefront of our minds and create that change together with Carolyn Harris behind us. Fantastic. Aren't we lucky? <laughs> Thanks so much, Carolyn. Thank you.